Great. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this afternoon's Lunch and Learn with Joe Thompson, uh, Class of 81 and founding director of Mass MoCA. So after over 30 years of service in North Adams, we are incredibly grateful to Joe for joining us for today's event. In addition to our Northern California EFs, I would also like to welcome members from the San Diego, Portland, Washington State, and Los Angeles Alumni Associations. Now, uh, this is truly a West Coast celebration. So we are also joined today by members from the class of 81. So a big thank you to everybody for being here. I'd like to offer a special thanks as well to the Williams Alumni Office, uh, particularly Rob Swan, who some of you just heard, for facilitating today's event, and to my colleague on the NorCal committee, Christopher Kirby, who will introduce Joe momentarily. In addition to Christopher's voluntary work on the NorCal committee, Christopher founded by GLADA, is currently a member of the Society of Alumni Executive Committee and volunteers as an alumni historian with the college's oral history project. For today's purposes, however, I'm pleased to introduce Christopher as Joe's freshman year roommate. Today's event will be delivered in a webinar format. Uh, we will enjoy a presentation by Joe for approximately 25 minutes, followed by a question and answer session. We encourage all of you who are joining us to submit questions via the Q&A button, which is at the bottom of your screen. These questions will be consolidated and read to Joe after the presentation concludes. A closed captions, as Rob mentioned earlier, are also available if you click the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen. And with that, I will turn it over to Christopher for an introduction. Hi, I'm uh, excited to have Joe Thompson, class of 1981, in part because Joe and I uh, were freshman year roommates in Lehman Hall uh, many years ago. Uh, Joe is the founding director of Mass MoCA and spent his early years working to open the museum in an industrial complex of brick, brick buildings in North Adams that had formerly been home to a textile mill and an electronics plant. Since its opening in 1999, Mass MoCA has become the largest institution in the United States devoted to today's most evocative art with 550,000 square feet of space on its 26 building, 16 acre factory campus in four large outdoor performing arts venues. Mass Mocha embraces all forms of art, music, sculpture, dance, film, painting, photography, theater, and new boundary crossing works of art that defy easy categorization. During this lunch and learn, Joe will be talking about the history, programming, and growth of Mass Mocha, followed by a discussion of the socioeconomic impact of Mass Mocha, including its impact on life in relationship to Williams College. After Joe uh, talks about what's next for Mass Mocha, we're going to have an extensive Q&A, and uh, Helen will be handling that portion. So with that, I turn it over to Joe. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, reminding me of that time in Lehman, I, I'll, I'll never forget when I arrived, our other two roommates, you may remember Eric Whiting, who's now co-chairman of Christie's, and Bob Hershey were fighting on the floor. And it, I had regaled my parents with stories about how sophisticated this college was. We'd never been here. I'd never been there. I, we drove up from Oklahoma. We pull in and there Eric and Bob were pummeling each other on the living room floor. What it turned out to be was they, they were fighting over who had to room with either Christopher or me. There were two singles in that room and one double. I think Bob had staked out the first single and they were fighting over who was gonna get the second one. Anyway, it was a fun, it was a, a my dad has always enjoyed kidding me about how sophisticated Williams is as we came in and there was literally blood on the floor. Anyway, it's good, good to be here. Um, I like to begin this talking about Mass Mocha by putting a couple of numbers up. Uh, I'm sure some of you will guess some of these, but the 18 and 18.5 was the percentage of unemployment in North Adams at the time Mass Mocha was first proposed. And number one was where North Adams sat on all the lists that you don't want to be on. Um, not only unemployment, but teenage pregnancy, domestic violence, 
and illiteracy. North Adams uh, ranked the highest in the Commonwealth of all cities or towns. It's particularly brutal. This is what the New York Times had to say about the place uh, about the time we were cranking up Mass Mocha. And the juxtaposition with Williamstown was rough. Uh, I don't know that Williamstown has ever gone over 2.2% unemployment ever. Um, so you had this kind of, you know, cheek by jowl, um, huge out migration. And it was this juxtaposition that really set the groundwork for Mass Mocha. I think the, 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 the college, I hope everybody realizes, was instrumental in the birthing of Mass Mocha. Uh, it really grew out sort of like a rib from Adam from the Williams College Museum of Art. Tom Krenz was the director then back in those days. Uh, Michael Govan, who now runs uh, Los Angeles uh, County Museum of Art, was on the staff. I was on the staff. And we had recently opened uh, the uh, Williams College Museum of Art, but found that it was, it was constricting. It was beautiful, but all those fancy white walls and beautifully polished floors and nice detailing uh, made it hard to work with contemporary artists. I particularly remember a show we did with Vito Acconci in which he wanted to rip out walls and rip up carpet and make numerous other changes, which we had to say no to. And he ended up methodically putting out his cigarettes. He smoked like a train, uh, putting, uh, putting out his cigarettes in the carpeted floor of the college museum and secretly lashing into the walls. Anyway, it was, it was that, that kind of experience that led our small staff at the college uh, to North Adams looking for essentially cheap space to show large scale art that was difficult to deal with in, in typical museums. We were talking mainly at that time, it was going to be a, a fixed, uh, essentially a fixed depot for large scale, mostly American minimal art. The idea changed a lot since then, but that was the original idea. North Adams had real estate in spades. We didn't begin with this site. Uh, mayor John Barrett, who was a first term freshman mayor, he went on to be the longest serving mayor in Massachusetts, but at that time he was, I think, eight months into the job when Sprague Electric announced that it was leaving this factory. And he dragged us across town into this space, which you know struck us as daunting and just impossibly large, but uh, we were young and, and hubris got the best of us. So we began to develop plans. I'm going to spare you the, the, the story of sort of what happened in the, in the next 12 years. But Tom went off to the Guggenheim and uh, took Michael with him. And I decided to stay because it struck me as a, a, a potentially you know, large soapbox. Uh, Tom and Michael flipped me the keys and said, good luck. Uh, it's going to be harder than you think. And boy, was that an understatement. Um, Governor Dukakis, who was our archangel, tried to run for president, lost, came back, and the economy of Massachusetts blew up, and it took 12 years to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. We finally did, uh, and we opened after a 13-year development effort in 1999, but not with the whole campus. This is an image of, of what we be began with. It was just a little under 200,000 square feet of space one commercial building on Marshall Street, uh, a really beautiful theater and uh, a, actually quite small uh, axis of galleries that went down the north edge over there. Um, we opened, people came, program was well received. Uh, we sort of careened from one near bankruptcy to the next and gradually grew the complex so that by 2014 or so, we had grown to about 400,000 square feet. You can see the buildings here, uh, including this uh, Saul Witt building here in the middle, which was a, a beautiful landmark installation. I'll show you some images of that in a second. We added quite a bit of commercial space along this whole front courtyard and continued to grow our use of outdoor courtyards. Uh, by 2017, uh, the, camp the campus was essentially built out, but for a couple of buildings, this building here uh, remains to be done. And the front door building that has the big Mass Mocha roof sign remains to be done. But all the rest is pretty much done. And we also helped a couple of other developments uh, 
The porch is in a really lovely uh, property, hotel property across the street. Uh, and the state district court all um, received TLC from MassMOCA. Um, the program during those 12 years in the woods changed dramatically from big art, fixed in place, and left up for a long time to something that felt much less like a box and much more like, to quote um, a California artist, Beck, two turntables and a microphone. But by that, I mean this. Uh, this is an image of uh, the Institute of Contemporary Art, a sister institution of Mass Mocha's in the other end of the state in Boston. It's a beautiful building by Diller and Scafidio. But here's what it looks like on the inside. It looks for, uh, to my eyes, like a like a great 19th century uh, museum building with beautiful white walls, lay lights, overhead lighting. Uh, they do do performances from time to time, but they're kind of, you know, pop into the gallery. In other words, there's not a lot about this space that separates it from the great sort of 17th and 18th and 19th century museological models. It's quite different uh, than the experience of Mass Mocha, which tends to be um, more embracing of large scale immersive work and certainly far more embracing of uh, performing arts. This is an installation from 2016 devoted to Nick Cave in which he essentially created this almost swimming pool-like miasma of space that you would wander through. It became um, a really wonderful staging ground for a wide range of performances by a lot of people that you would recognize. This happens to be the great choreographer, Bill T. Jones who did a series of performances there, uh, which he's continuing to develop. Uh, this is a performance by Nick Cave and his sound suits that took place, I think, uh, the following summer. So you get, the, you get the picture. We also make a lot of work at Mass Smoka. It's not the kind of place where stuff arrives in a crate and then we unpack it and put it on the walls. We often, we often make it. Uh, this installation by Tsai Guo Cheng went on, for those of you from, uh, from Northwest, you might recognize this. This hung at the Seattle Art Museum uh, for I think four or five years, maybe a little longer. It, we built it and then it traveled to the Guggenheim and several other places before landing uh, finally at, in Seattle. Um, in, in making these things, things happen along the way. I've got a, a, a quick story about this one. This is again, another work by Sai Guo Cheng. It was nine tigers floating in space. These were suspended. Uh, each tiger had 100 bronze tip arrows in it. As typical, we were running late in the installation and it fell to me to drill the holes. These were, by the way, these were, these are artificial. They're beautifully rendered, but they're completely artificial tigers. You might be relieved to hear. Um, but it was my job to drill the holes and stick the arrows in. We, I was behind. I conscripted my then seven-year-old son trainer to help. Uh, so I was the drill. He was the he was poking, and we were, you know, drilling in the face and sticking these things in. Very disturbing to to trainer. Uh, Sai Guo Cheng, very dignified, elegant Chinese artist, happened to walk into the room when we were working on this piece, and trainer, who's very shy, just stood up and looked uh, Sai Guo Cheng in the eye and said, "Mr. Sai." Don't you think that three or four arrows would have been enough? <laughs> so uh, things like that happen all the time. Uh, we also make work in our stages. This is the great South African artist, William Kentridge, who arrived at Massamoka several years ago with a suitcase. And in the suitcase was this little maquette, this, this what might look like a stage rendering. It's actually, these are like dollhouse size props. Um, he brought 75 actors and technicians from South Africa, and we spent uh, the better part of six weeks fabricating this work. There you see that uh, big phone. We built shadow puppets and a wide range of others. And then uh, the show went left from North Adams and, and premiered at the Tate in London before going to the Armory uh, in New York and then traveling around the world. So um, what a lot of people who don't live close to Massmoka, don't realize is that the performing arts take up fully half of our emotional and financial bandwidth. We present performing arts events, sometimes made at Massmoka, sometimes brought in some 42 weekends a year. Uh, 
many of the works travel. This is a San Francisco artist, Darren Watterson, who was in North Adams for the better part of a year manufacturing this wild kind of you know, drugged out psychotropic take on uh, Whistler's Peacock Room, the Peacock Room, which now sits at the Smithsonian uh, Sackler Gallery. He made this uh, uh, psychedelic version of it. We uh, showed it for a year or so at Mass Smoke, and then it went on to a, a very long run at the Smithsonian and uh, the V&A in, in London. So we're all in when it comes to making art and love to make it. The probably the most famous example of that is this uh, 60 person one year effort to create what is in effect, um, I think the world's repository for the wall drawings of the great Saul Witt. It's a beautiful exhibition that will be uh, on loan at, to Ma at Mass Mocha for another 25 years or so. We don't collect art. Uh, we team up directly with artists and make installations that often stay up for a very long time. James Terrell is another example of this kind of work. Uh, we, we are proud to host, I think, one of every kind of work that James Terrell has made in his career. We're just about to complete the last category that uh, we, we didn't have covered before, which was a, a sky space that will open in May of this year, which is one of the last projects um, that I'm working on under my uh, soon to close tenure at Mass Mocha. Two other artists, Lori Anderson and Jenny Holzer, have long-term residencies at Mass Mocha. They're both still in the prime of their career. Uh, Lori asked me once in passing what a museum of her work would look like, and I said, I don't, I don't know. You tell me. And she said, I think it would be like a radio station. And that image was hard to get out of my mind. We worked together for I don't know six or seven years. So think what a museum of Laurie Anderson might look like. And we have it on display. She again has a 15 year run at Mass Mocha. She's using the place like a studio. Sometimes our performing arts are more popular than Laurie Anderson. This is a, one of our, another uh, programming partner of ours, uh, Fresh Grass, which is a San Francisco based repository for all things uh, bluegrass and sort of alt country. Our, our partner, Chris Wadsworth, lands at Mass Mocha every September for performances that include grapes like Mavis Staples and many others. Uh, we hope to launch this again. We had to take a skip last year. We've got it scheduled for uh, the third week of September this year. And then uh, we're taking this uh, festival to Bentonville, uh, where we'll present it in the Walton's new uh, momentary museum in Bentonville, Arkansas. That's in October. Uh, we also team up with artists in other ways. The band Wilco, for example, uh, comes to Mass Mocha every other summer to present concerts and a whole series of works. But I thought I would show you something that's, that's, that uh, might indicate how these, these kind of deep partnerships go a little askew sometimes and awry in interesting ways. That's Jeff Tweedy, of course, the great frontman there at the front. But in the back, you see uh, Glenn Kachi. Uh, to my eye, like one, one of the best percussionists alive right now, Glenn introduced us to a body of work by Gunnar Schoenbeck, a wide, weird, hand-wrought instruments by uh, this really wonderful music professor at Bennington College. We slowly began bringing these instruments to Mass Mocha for artists like Glenn and Wilco to use in their performances. It, it, it set up a partnership with both Bennington College and the estate of Gunnar Schoenbeck. Uh, and it also triggered something that's really interesting right now that you might not realize out in California is that North Adams is becoming the home for a wide range of musicians. Uh, that's Mark Stewart, who's Paul Simon's uh, head of music. Uh, Mark and his family moved to North Adams, and there are eight or nine other musicians from Bang on a Can and, and from Wilco who have uh, purchased homes in North Adams. North Adams is becoming a really musically interesting place to be. Uh, to surface that, the Porches Inn recently built this kind of interesting beetle-shaped building here, uh, which is not only a beautiful special event space, but it's also uh, a really wonderful state-of-the-art recording facility featuring a Constellation sound system. It's truly one of the best recording facilities in the country. And that's what I mean by 
mass mocha is not so much a box as uh, two turntables tables and a platform. It's an active environment where new work gets made. The effect on North Adams has been interesting, slower than I might have hoped, but strong. Uh, our visitation has grown from well under 100,000 in the earlier days to 300,000 or so the last three or four years. Uh, we've filled up our commercial space with 30, I think there are 35 businesses now who uh, employ about three or 400 people. They pay rent to, muse to the museum. There's all kinds of new businesses in North Adams. Um, downtown storefront occupancy has gone from 70% vacant to about 70% full. Um, the number of hotel rooms has grown from 17 to about oh, 250 or so. And Mass Mocha and its commercial uh, uh, tenants gen off about $52 million a year of economic impact. There are many things that are equally important, not the least of which is that uh, Mass Mocha, with the help of Williams College and the Clark, are the, provide the de facto art education services to all the elementary schools in North Adams, which were a long partnership that we're quite proud of. So it's a complicated place. It's definitely about art and performing arts, but it's also about jobs and social capital and uh, increasingly, I think, community health. Um, I'd be happy to answer questions if you have them. And thanks for this chance. Oh, I forgot this. Um, somebody asked what I might do next. I'm, I'm very interested in, in bike trails. I'll show you why. I've taken up biking recently and, and, and love it. But in my view, this that's Mount Greylock you see there. Um, if we can complete the 38 mile circumnavigation of Mount Greylock and these really adventuresome hills up and over, I think that uh, our little corner of Massachusetts could become one of the premier destination uh, road biking and single track mountain biking destinations in the country. We've started it, their loops are, oh, we're almost around. You see, we're missing a couple of spots from Adams to North Adams and North Adams to Williamstown. Those are under development right now. We got a little ahead of it and built a tunnel. You can see this, this trail. This is the Mass Mocha campus and we've built in a series of bike trails. The reason we're doing that is to act as the pivot point, the linchpin between the southern route to Adams and the Ashwillitic Trail and the western route to Williamstown that will go right through Mass Mocha. Uh, we built the, this tunnel. It's there now. It's a bike tunnel to nowhere at the moment, um, but it's going to be great. Thank you. A any questions? Joe, thank you so much uh, for the presentation. We have a couple questions that have come up um, in the course of your discussion. The first one is actually, uh, what was your major at Williams and um, what experience at Williams best prepared you for this role at Mass Mocha? Oh, um, yeah, I was a double major. I was, I was, um, sort of a hardcore economics major for my first three years. Um, and But I spent my junior year in Vienna and hung out at the Albertina Museum and the Kunsthistorisches Museum. And it dawned on me that there, there, was, there were work and jobs and a whole other way of living a life that could happen in a museum. And I um, came back in my senior year I think I took one economics course with Morty Shapiro to finish my economics major so that my father would not have a heart attack. And I took seven art history courses to become, and so I was a double major, um, art history and economics, rather uh, late, in late, late in the game switch, but I'm glad I did. Okay, this is definitely a topic that's on everyone's minds too, but another question that came up was, how has the pandemic affected Mass Mocha's operations? Brutal. Pandemic, uh, I thought we had a brilliant, really brilliant business plan and was quite proud of the fact that 70 or 75% of our budget was made through earned income, ticket sales, concert sales, lease income, um, we were scrappy. Uh, we don't have a big endowment. We have a, 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 an endowment of, at that time, roughly 22, $24 million. So two times our, two times our budget. Uh, of course, when 100% of your earned income stops in two days, uh, it's rather devastating. And that, that's what happened on March 15, 16 last year. Um, 
we acted quickly and, and when the hardest set of decisions I ever had to make, I think I laid off, uh, it was devastating, laid off 125 or 126 out of 165 of my colleagues, many of whom had uh, worked with me for 20 and 25 years. So it was a painful moment to uh, be sure. Um, but I felt like we had to, the, you know, the, it was so murky in the future and we just didn't have any, we had no cash reserve. So uh, we, we acted very swiftly. I'm happy to say that we reopened on July 11. Uh, and by now we have 133 of our employees back. So we're still down about 20% from our peak. Visitation was very strong through the through the summer. Massamoka is so big. I mean, uh, you know, you could you measured your measure. Uh, I think it was seven acres of interior gallery space. Lots of windows and doors. People felt safe and they came in strong numbers. Um, slowed down again around Thanksgiving and it remains. I don't know. We're probably we're probably running about forty or forty percent of our of our normal. I'm convinced the audience is going to come back buoyantly. Um, I'm happy that we were able to protect our little kind of nest egg endowment. We still, um, the ship's still afloat, uh, a little bit damaged, but uh, when we get back open, I think crowds are going to come in strong numbers and we'll do, we'll be a okay. Thank you. Um, here's a question going back to your art history and economics uh, double major. Um, in the dozen year run up to Mass Mocha's 1999 opening, how did your own understanding of art and broader economics develop? It changed totally, and so did the program. Um, for, for one thing, as I mentioned, the original idea was big art in big spaces. What we show now is almost all changing exhibitions. We have a few of these long term commitments that I showed you Terrell and LeWitt, Kiefer, uh, Louise Bourgeois, Jenny, and Lori. Um, but the the vast the vast uh, uh, the just the overwhelming majority of our galleries are used for changing exhibitions that we change every year. So uh, change not fixed in place. Number two, um, I I made some interesting friends during that time. David Byrne, I did a big exhibition for, and a few other performing artists, and they pointed out that uh, the same arguments I made about space and time. Uh, for visual artists applied to performing artists as well. So uh, in that period, just before we started construction, 97, 98, 99, we kind of rethought the whole program and uh, performing arts are, are fully half of what we do now. So that was another huge change. I'm thankful we did. I think that had we opened at Mass Moca 1, I don't know whether we survived. Mass Moca 1 did get built, by the way. Michael Govan, who I mentioned earlier, who now is at LA, uh, LA County uh, built an exquisite rendition of the Massimoco One idea. It's called Dia Beacon. It's in Beacon, New York, uh, and it's uh, largely fixed in place, really beautifully installed art, mainly of the 60s and 70s. Um, they have the luxury of a, of a train stop in their front yard, the front door of the Dia, which goes right to Grand Central. <laughs> we don't have that in North Adams, and I I fear that had we opened with the original model, repeat visitation would have declined. And I hate to think about what would have happened to the museum. Um, with this performing arts dynamic, because almost every weekend there's uh, some kind of razzmatazz show going on, where it's, we're as much a honky tonk as a museum, uh, which means that there, you know, there are previews of upcoming concerts, there are reviews, there are uh, all kinds of uh, excuses for doing advertising campaigns and social media campaigns, which just interjects a lot of vibrancy and buzz. And many people who end up coming to the concerts find their ways to the galleries and find out it's not as bad as they think, and they come back. Uh, there's another question here from Edward about the museum's early days and, and you specifically. Um, he'd like to know what kept you at it in your 20s? And you know, comments that other opportunities must have been knocking, but you stuck with it with a big uncertain vision. So well, yeah. what you took away? You know, it, it it was it had a big potential payoff, and I the the answer always seemed to to you know I was naive for one thing, and you're young, and you're in your you're in your twenties, and you think you can do anything, and um, there was not a lot of downside risk. Didn't yet have kids, and uh, the things that make you worry about careers and things like that. So. 
it just was, you know, it was a big challenge, a, a potentially a big payoff, a lot of work. And there was always seemed like one thing that we could do out there in, you know, four or five months that would change the governor's mind or that would stimulate more private gifts or that would unlock the land and buildings. And, um, you know, you, you've six months at a time and suddenly, you know, 10 years went by. Um, then we got open and uh, it was a completely different set of challenges. It was more about keeping it open, growing the institution. The, our reviews were always strong. Our program has always been, I think, absolutely rock solid. Uh, we had to build an audience uh, and that took, that took time. We had to raise endowment. That took time. We had a few, a, a few you know, really generous, generous, loyal trustees who, who uh, stood by the museum through thick and thin. Uh, many of them came from and out of Williams College, so uh, we're forever beholden to the college for uh, not only the birth of Mass Mocha, but its early sustenance and nourishment in those really challenging early days, like 1999 to 2007, 2008. Yeah, there are actually there are a couple follow-up questions here about funding and and really how Mass Mocha got started. One in particular is. You know, how did you get the funding to start, which you just spoke about a little bit, but also how can federal, state, and local government support art as an economic driver? Uh, I think, well, first of all, we, we've gotten several, we, Massamoka is privately funded with respect to its operations and program. However, um, we received two fundamental infrastructure grants. The first was a $35 million grant uh, that uh, Governor Dukakis sponsored. It took a long time to actually land that grant. We won it, we thought, in 87, 88. It, uh, uh, Republican governor, Governor Weld, finally released the money in um, 1997. I'll tell a quick story. Are we doing okay for time? Yeah, I can tell a quick story, which kind of under the goes to show category. Um, governor Weld was deeply opposed to Mass Moco when he took office. I mentioned the cease and desist order. I think one of his early quotes, I can't to Time Magazine was this, over my dead body, will the Commonwealth of Massachusetts release one penny for a museum of contemporary art of all things in North Adams of all places. If you take apart that statement, there's not a lot of air. Uh, it, he <laughs> systematically closed every, every door. Uh, he became a friend. He, be, he started as Darth Vader, but he became a friend. Um, and the friendship developed over years of me nagging him on one hand and local business people gathering up support and raising money. We did a campaign and raised a million. He sent us back to raise two and two became four and four became eight. And during this time, he became intrigued by the project when it would occasionally Drop by. His brother had a duck hunting blind up in the Adirondacks, and North Adams was on his way along Route 2 from Boston. And one time he dropped in, and I had just organized an exhibition with David Byrne, um, and it was extravagant 10,000 square feet. It started off as a small uh, show of photographs, but it grew to include video walls. And David had a little bit of a, of a a nervous moment a week or so before it opened uh, in, in which he decided that no one was going to stay and look at this fantastic installation that he'd done. I told him that's just the way it works in, in museums. You don't get to control people's time. Uh, but he said, oh, yes, I can. Sixteen minute uh, little mini rock opera, which was beautiful. It was just when he was getting interested in Brazilian beats and Latin American music, great music. Uh, but it was also really profane. I mean, it was one nasty piece of music, funny, uh, but full of obscenities. And uh, it, so the way the show would work, you'd go into this show and put on a Walkman. I think we could afford to buy 12 of them and people would go in and listen to this tune for 16 minutes. Uh, and people did stay. Um, Governor Weld happened to show up the day after that open. There was a long line of people uh, waiting to get into this pigeon shit filled and gallery that we had with uh, porta potties and leaky roofs. It was a mess. 
but people liked it. And uh, Governor Weld said, so Joe, what's going on over there? And I said, nothing. Um, and he said, well, something's going on. And he of course insisted on going, he put on the headphones, he disappeared for 16 minutes. And I thought, this is what it feels like when something you've been working on for 10 years dies right before your very eyes. I mean, he came out, took off the headphones and he said, so this, I, is this what you would propose doing if the Commonwealth were to release $35 million of taxpayers' money? And I said, yeah, we would, there would be fewer pigeons and no porta potties. And instead of 10,000 square feet, there'd be 300,000 square feet of this kind of art. But this is exactly the kind of art that we would show. And he said, I read that the man makes music. Could you name one song that I might know? And I, I wasn't going to pick Psycho Killer. So I, I said, mine. And of course, the governor, who was completely pulling my chain, sang it perfectly. And he said, name another song by David Byrne. And I said, I don't know, Air? And he knew every lyric. In short, he was a huge Talking Heads fan. <laughs> and so uh, he just and he was sitting there in his blue suit and red tie and Boston Brahmin shoes. And it just goes to show you never, you never know what's in a person's soul in some ways. And I think that that moment was a, was a tripping point. We had already you know, raised $8 million of of private funds, so this was no longer just a you know a, a publicly funded project. But um, I don't know what it. I think you know continuity helps. Um, Massamoka has enjoyed the support of seven governors from all political stripes and uh, three mayors, uh, and I the um, the payoff for the Commonwealth has been huge. It's, if nothing else, it's a it's a case study for how. Um, well, you know, well-targeted, creative-based, arts-based economic development can make a huge difference to, particularly to local economies. I don't think it, it doesn't work everywhere, but in the right conditions, art can be a powerful uh, economic dynamo. Yeah, and that's actually a good segue because there are definitely, there are a number of people who want to know more about that in particular. Um, one question is, you know, could you talk about how MassMoca has changed some of the statistics that you shared at the beginning of your presentation with regards to unemployment, crime rates, occupancy, et cetera? Um, and then also, you know, how the educational programs that you host uh, affect the interest in art appreciation and, and education in the community. Yeah, that's interesting. First of all, I'd say that it, it, it took a lot longer than I thought. I mean, had we been having this conversation six or seven years ago, um, you might have heard a little disappointment in my voice. Actually, I feel quite good about now the, um, there's a buoyancy in the North Adams community, even now, even after uh, the, you know, a year of COVID misery. Um, you, can, you can represent some of it in statistics. You know, I think unemployment has gone from seven times the state average to one and a half times the state average, which means it's still quite high compared to the rest of the state, but it's no longer catastrophic. Um, I think the, the big ones for me are, are softer. There used to be this kind of socioeconomic maginot line between North Adams and Williamstown. Many of our, many of our uh, listeners will remember those times that on campus you didn't go to North Adams for there's not a lot of reasons to go. That's really, that's really softened. Uh, if you live in Williamstown, you're probably more likely to go out to eat in North Adams than Williamstown these days. The restaurant scene is vibrant. Um, there, the two of the, there are three new hotels, uh, four new hotels now recently, and we're proud of that too. We're stimulating quite a bit of uh, hotel growth, but probably two of the nicer properties are in North Adams. The Porches Inn and the Tourist Inn are both really great. Uh, the Tourist Inn is co-owned by one of the Wilco uh, musicians, and it's like just as hip as you might imagine it would be. Um, so, and there, there a lot of other things too, the banks are now co There's a easier movement of, of human capital and, and financial capital between the two communities and it no longer feels dangerous. I remember that in the, back in the early days when we were thinking about this, you know, William's worry was that, you know, you, you, it wasn't so much a town gown as a Williamstown North Adams that the relationship between the two could be like, you know, Trinity uh, Hartford or Yale New Haven is much different today than it was 25 years ago. But there was a worry 
on behalf of them at the college of what the economic future, not only of North Adams would be, but maybe Williamstown would be, unless we could turn around this, uh, this kind of neutron bomb black hole that had developed in North Adams. And that's gotten much, much better. Uh, there are a lot of young people moving to North Adams. You know, you can still get houses for a hundred, a hundred and fifty, two hundred thousand dollars um, on a great street in North Adams, and that's you know a third or a fourth of what the same property might cost in Williamstown. So a lot of people who might have been looking at Williamstown or Stockbridge or uh, their kind of Berkshire home are seeing North Adams as a viable alternative now. There's still tons of work to do. Poverty rate's still high. There's still, you know, generations of families who have been out of work for three or four generations who uh, still need all kinds of help. So the work is is not even close to done. It feels like we're halfway into a, you know, a 50 year project. Yeah, and that actually, there's a great follow up question on that too. You know, as you are preparing to end your tenure, which a lot of people are asking about as well, you know, what would you like to see as part of the future of MassMoca? And how does that really reflect your view of the relationship between Adams, North Adams, and Williamstown in terms of art, culture, and economics? Well, you know, there's a remarkable ecosystem that exists up here. I think there are more art, are there are more art historians and people involved in the visual arts per capita in the northern tier of Berkshire County than anywhere else in the country. Um, people will know of the, of the so-called Williams Art Mafia, but that's uh, sort of out of date and really the tip of the iceberg right now. Um, I'm very excited that the college is, is actively contemplating a new location uh, for the Williams College Museum of Art and probably a, a new look about what that College, the college museum experience should be given the Clark and given Massmoca and our performing and, and visual arts. I mean, to, to be a student at Williams interested in uh, visual culture or the performing arts increasingly so would be a, a, a great place to be more than, more than ever. So I'm, I'm keen to see how that, the, the, the new college art museum uh, affects Massmoca as much as the other way uh, as much as the other way around. Um, you know, I, I, I'm bullish on not only the northern tier of Berkshire County, but all of Berkshire County. I can't think of very many other places that have the kind of rural splendor, spectacular outdoor nature, great access to sports, uh, side by side with this constellation of cultural attractions that include the Clark, the Theater Festival, Mass Mocha, uh, all the college facilities, of course, but also um, Tanglewood and Jacob's Pillow. And, uh, you know, if you look and cast your eyes, where, where might it be? Well, there's Napa and Sonoma, but I think the cultural facilities here are, are superior. There's the Hamptons, there's Santa Fe, which is an interesting area in that way. But I don't know that any of them hold a candle to the Berkshires, to tell you the truth. We won't take that too personally in NorCal, but I just missed the opportunity to get a little poke in. So <laughs> appreciate it. Um, there are a couple questions, sort of following up on that as well. This is this will be a two-part question, really. You know, how does MassMoco work with Williams students today? And then uh, turning to the Williams experience too. You know, what advice would you give to recent graduates? and current students who are, you know, just starting to navigate life. And is there anything you wish you had done differently in college that you would encourage them to do now? Yeah, uh, on, the form, on the first question, first, uh, every Williams student, while they are a student at Williams are automatically uh, members of MassMoca and get to enjoy, enjoy the galleries for free and the performing arts roster at, at big discounts. So there's that sort of, direct tie-in. Williams students form a large part of our membership. Um, there's more formal programming as well. I think many professors use MassMoca galleries and the content that we show in their, in their classroom spaces. Um, Kids Space, which is the core of our uh, education programming, was really invented at Williams College and uh, staffed largely with uh, Williams folks and Clark Art Institute was also very helpful in that. So there's there's a wide range of programs that are continually rolling on. With respect to um, students and getting started, I don't I don't know if I have any great advice on that, except uh, 
follow your nose. I mean, um, I worked in the oil fields for a year or so and bounced around Europe and was clueless about what I was going to do until I came back uh, to visit friends at Williams. And I dropped in on my former professor, Tom Krenz, and ended up um, getting hired to help him do a, a, a part-time two-week installation that uh, ended up being a three-year job and um, the beginning of my career. So I think uh, be brave and follow your nose and don't be afraid to wander, I guess, would be my advice. So while we have a few minutes remaining, there are definitely a number of questions about what's what's next for Mass MoCA in this year of transition, but specifically to you know, what's next for you. You talked a little bit about um, the cycling project that you're working on in North Adams. That's, that's you know, kind of got your yeah. mind. But I think Helen, everyone would love to hear what's, what's on the horizon for you after this. Yeah, Helen I, I don't, Helen, I don't really know for sure. Um, I've decided I'm, I'm sort of one foot in, one foot out now and enjoying it. My, that's such a, uh, a powerfully talented crew of, of, of staff at Mass MoCA who are not only tending the shop, they're making the place better every day. So uh, the board is strong. Our, fi our finances are not as strong as I would hope, but they're pretty darn strong. They're gonna get stronger. So the institution feels just rock solid to me. Um, there are a few big opportunities. We've, we've explored a, what I think is a really exciting idea. It's going to be up to the next person to pursue it or not though. And it, it was an idea of like, what if, what if Mass Mocha was a place that say, you know, the 10 best schools of visual and performing arts and film and multimedia had studios away from campus all at Mass Mocha. So instead of going to Siena or Rome or uh, someplace else to study that if you were at, uh, if you were in the Beijing Art Academy or RISD or Juilliard or Berkeley School of Music, each of those places would have four or five really wonderful light filled studios uh, right tucked into the middle of the Mass Mocha campus. It would get, bring to Mass Mocha a hundred, um, you know, creative and, and young makers who would get to know the place. It would create an instant community. It'd be a way of it, uh, introducing uh, far more diversity than we now have into our program. Um, and I just would love the idea of getting to know those hundred students year over year, building a kind of alumni base. I'm very jealous of William's alumni base. Um, there are other ideas and I can't wait to the, you know, the next person will change the place a whole hog, I hope. Uh, I'm, I'm committed to staying here through, I don't know what, the late summer, early fall to help get that new, new leadership in place. And um, then I'll, I, for me, I, and I don't have a clue what I'm going to do. Uh, maybe build bike paths. Um, I probably won't work in another museum. I don't know. It'd have to, I don't know what would come along. I don't know. I have six months to think about it and I look forward to enjoying that. Well, Joe, thank you very much. Um, I just want to read one comment to, uh, from one of our attendees today who said, no questions, just gratitude, Joe. Thank you very much for your wonderful work. I'm amazed okay. and delighted every time I visit Mass Mocha and I appreciate what you've done for my favorite corner of Massachusetts. So I think that really sums it up very nicely. Joe, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank, thank you for having me. I mean, I've, been, I've enjoyed it. And I would invite everybody to please, please visit when you're next in the Berkshires and uh, stay tuned. We're, gonna, we're going to have a very interesting online gala coming up sometime in mid-April that's going to have a fascinating program with some, some star power. That, so stay tuned for that. Thank you. Great, well, we'll stay tuned and thank you to everyone who attended today. Um, we had nearly a hundred attendees, which is fantastic. Um, so in this bicentennial year, we'll look forward to continuing to celebrate together. And Joe, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you, bye-bye.